Hello all and welcome back. In this lecture we're going to talk about some material from chapter 3 in our text. In this chapter we focus on the structure of the nervous system. First let's take a look at the basic structure of both the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Now as we learned last chapter the central nervous system includes both the brain and the spinal cord which again are encased in bone as well as what is called cerebral spinal fluid. This is the fluid that surrounds your spinal cord and also surrounds your brain within your skull. This basically is what is going to keep your brain from hitting the inside of your skull. In your peripheral nervous system, you have what are called cranial nerves. You have different sets of cranial nerves depending upon the sense in which they are allocated to. So for example, you have a cranial nerve for vision, for example. We will go through each of those cranial nerves, as well as also spinal nerves, peripheral ganglia, and all of these are encased within your vertebral column, so inside of your vertebra. Let's focus on the brain first. This, as you might guess, is the most protected organ in your body. It's encased in very thick bone, um, of your skull. There are varying layers, as we will learn about in this chapter, as well as CSF, or that cerebral spinal fluid. It receives about 20% of the total blood flow from your heart, and this is happening continuously. Now, your brain can't extract the energy that it needs to function without oxygen. Now, what that means is that if you go without oxygen for even just a few minutes, after that few minutes, permanent brain damage may begin. As we move along throughout this chapter and in future chapters as well, we are going to start learning about different parts of the body, different parts of the brain, and a lot of these will be talked about in relationship to other parts of the brain or other parts of the body. So at this point, it is important that we establish what anatomical directions are. That way we have an idea of where a certain body part is relative to other body parts around it. So first we'll look at what is interior, so interior direction. This basically means front end. So here we are looking at both an alligator and a person. It's kind of helpful to look at both so we kind of have a better idea of what that really means. So anterior again is in reference to toward the front. So we can see anterior is going toward the front of the animal both for the alligator and for the person out toward the front. Posterior is the opposite direction, so toward the tail end. So for the alligator, toward the tail, and for the person, toward the feet. Rostral means in towards the mouth. So towards the mouth. Caudal means out toward the tail. Ventral is in reference to the front portion of the body. So for the person, it's going to be the whole front section of the body. So if the person is facing sideways and you can see their, um, their profile, it will be the front section of their body. So that will include their, the, the portion of their face, toes, etc., the front of the knees, the front portion of the body. For the alligator, it is the um, bottom portion here that is most closest to the ground. So that's going to include their feet, stomach, bottom portion of the tail. And dorsal then is going to be the back portion of the organism. So for the alligator, it's going to be the actual back of the alligator. So that would be the top portion here. For the person, it is the back portion. So including the heels, back of the head, um, all the back portion of the body. Now lateral means out toward the sides. So from the center of the body, both on the person and on the alligator, um, we're going out from the center towards the sides. Conversely, medial means toward the middle. So from the outside toward the middle of the organism. Outside toward the middle. Continuing, we will also, particularly when we are looking at portions of the brain, hear about different 
lanes or cross sections that things are divided into. Hopefully, these visuals we'll take a look at here will help you a bit in, in terms of understanding the layout of things and how things are um, essentially sectioned off. So first, we'll take a look at the frontal plane. This is also sometimes referred to as the coronal plane. Basically, with this plane, we split into front and back sections. So if we were to take a sheet of glass or plexiglass, for example, and we have a person here, if we were to put this plexiglass straight down the middle of their body and divide it into a front section and a back section, this would be a frontal plane slice or section. Next, we have the sagittal plane. This is a perpendicular to the ground. So this is splitting the person in half again, but instead of front and back portions, we're going to have left and right portions. So we're splitting the individual into a left and right sides. Last, we have horizontal. This is again going to split the person into two again, but in this case, we have an upper portion and a lower portion. Now again, these planes become more important as we're taking a look at cross sections of the brain. So as you read your text, you will see, for example, this particular picture is a, a frontal slice or frontal cross section of this particular area of the brain. So hopefully looking at these anatomical directions in this way will give you a better idea visually of what these things actually mean. And here is all of those placed together. Okay, now sometimes you will hear the term ipsilateral or contralateral. That is in reference to either same side or for contralateral, opposite side of the body. So for example, your olfactory bulb, so this um, is the area for um, the sense of smell, projects its axons, so neurons or cells inside the olfactory bulb, project their axons into the ipsilateral hemisphere or into the same side hemisphere. Conversely, we have something like the motor cortex. Now the motor cortex controls the contralateral side um, for which um, things are being received. So for example, if your left motor cortex is active, that is actually going to control your right side. Depending upon what type, um, what area of the motor cortex is activated, for example, if it is the area that um, is active when you are moving your hand, for example, if your left motor cortex, the portion that um, controls your hand is activated, that is actually going to activate the opposite hand or your right hand. Hand. And we say that this is contralateral or opposite side of the body. Now let's take a look at some brain structures. So here we're taking a look at a brain cross section. I'll give you a second to think about which cross section we would be looking at here. This would actually be a sagittal slice. So with the sagittal slice, if you remember a few slides ago, the sagittal slice divides the individual into left and right hand sides or portions. So this particular cross section is dividing the person in half, left and right. Okay, so here we're taking a look at what are called meninges. Um, the meninges are the layers that are covering both the brain and the spinal cord. Here we're looking at the meninges in the brain and we have a zoomed in view here, so we can actually take a look at the different layers. So here we have the brain, and right between the brain and the skull, we have three different layers, and these are the layers of the meninges. So first, the outermost that is right next to your skull is called the dura mater, or the dura um, mater. Um, the dura mater is the outermost layer again, so it's the outermost layer of the meninges. It's the closest to the skull, and it makes sense then that it would also be the toughest, right? Um, it is somewhat flexible, but it is not stretchable. It is thick and it is tough. Next, you have the arachnoid space or the arachnoid matter. This is kind of more um, spongy, which is why sometimes it is called the arachnoid space. 
because it um, it kind of looks like a sponge, um, almost web-like. And you can see that right here. And then the innermost, the layer that is right against your brain is called the pia mater. Um, this is again the innermost, it's the closest to the brain. Um, the surface of it has blood vessels um, of the brain and the spinal cord that are um, here. So this particular layer, again, is going to be the innermost. It's going to uh, be what is directly covering your brain and your spinal cord. And here are going to be blood vessels that are going to be supplying your brain and your spinal cord. Now we also have what is called the subarachnoid space. So this is the gap between the arachnoid membrane and the pia mater. So kind of right in here. And this is mostly filled with cerebral spinal fluid. Here we take a look at more brain structures. Um, we're going to take a look at the ventricles. We have four ventricles total in our brain. These are hollow chambers within the brain that contain cerebral spinal fluid. And we're going to take a look at these from a few different views. Here we have a view of someone looking directly at us. So if you were looking at directly at someone, they would be directly facing us in this view. And in this view, we're seeing a profile. So the person would actually be facing this direction here, facing to the left. So first we take a look at the lateral ventricles. These are located here and here. Lateral meaning out toward the sides, if you remember from earlier in this lecture. So from the midpoint of the brain, out toward either sides, lateral ventricles. And from the profile view, we can see them here, the uppermost. These are connected to the third ventricle, which is located along the brain's midline. Um, I would imagine at some point you all have at least heard of the hemispheres of the brain. Um, we have two hemispheres of our brain, and the third ventricle kind of runs along the dividing line or the midline of the brain here. And again, it is connected to the lateral ventricles. Then we have the cerebral aqueduct, which connects the third and fourth ventricles. So the cerebral aqueduct is located here, and it is connecting the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle here, the lowermost. Um, next, we have what is called the choroid plexus. This is a very important structure in your brain right here. It's located um, right next to, or kind of in actually, the fourth ventricle. It is very rich in blood and projects into all of the ventricles. It is responsible for producing and containing all of your cerebral spinal fluid, a very important structure. It produces cerebral spinal fluid continuously. Um, it replenishes itself completely several times a day. Um, the max capacity is about 125 milliliters. And again, it flows from all, uh, it flows into all ventricles. So flows from the lateral ventricles, third ventricle, and the fourth ventricle. And then through um, small openings in the subarachnoid space, which is um, one of the meninges, or um, in between two layers of the meninges. So those outermost layers that are separating your brain from your skull. Um, it flows actually into that space and fills it with that cerebral spinal fluid. Um, and again, this is happening continuously. It was a very, very important brain structure. Now let's look more at CSF or cerebral spinal fluid. So your brain on average weighs about 1400 grams. It is very soft and very jelly-like. Um, if it didn't have cerebral spinal fluid to float in, um, essentially it couldn't support itself. So your brain would actually collapse. All of your brain structures would kind of condense down and collapse upon themselves and kind of become a ball of squish, essentially. So your CSF basically helps it float and maintain its shape and reduce its weight to about 80 grams, which is much more manageable, which keeps it again from collapsing on itself. Um, and this also greatly reduces the pressure on the base of your brain as well. And it also reduces shock to your uh, central nervous system. So um, again, it kind of pads your brain. So if you were to 
Um, for example, be in a car and somebody were to slam on the brakes really hard, you of course are going to kind of fly forward. Um, and the reason why your brain doesn't smack the front of your skull is because of your cerebral spinal fluid. Now there can be issues with cerebral spinal fluid. The first of which that your text talks about is what is called hydrocephalus. Um, this has also been referred to as water head. Um, basically what happens with this is that the cerebral aqueduct is too small to accommodate normal cerebral spinal fluid flow. So that cerebral aqueduct that, can, that connects the third and the fourth ventricle with um, someone who has hydrocephalus, that aqueduct is too small. And so enough cerebral spinal fluid can't flow through it. What this does is increase the pressure on the ventricles because the choroid plexus, which is producing that cerebral spinal fluid, is still producing the normal amount of it, but it can't flow freely through the ventricles because the cerebral aqueduct is too small. So the ventricles become under pressure and wind up having too much fluid and essentially they swell. So the walls of the, ventricle try, the ventricles try to expand um, to accommodate the extra CSF that can't flow freely. And what happens is essentially swelling. Um, and, and that is really why um, this is sometimes referred to as waterhead. So what they do is insert a tube directly into the lateral ventricle here. And what this does is essentially try to drain off the fluid. And the fluid then will be kind of uh, piped down to the abdominal cavity. So it will be gotten rid of that way. This is also called a shunt. Now this is left untreated, brain damage obviously will occur and it can be fatal. This is something that is um, known almost always before a child is born. So it can be dealt with early on. Now we're going to take a look at the nervous system and its development. So we've been discussing the central nervous system thus far in lecture. We've been talking about structures in the brain. Um, now we're going to think about how all of this actually comes to be. How is it that your brain and your spinal cord actually develop? Here we're looking at the development at a very, very, very early stage. So 18 days after conception, the development of the nervous system begins to happen. Here we're taking a look at what is called the ectoderm or what is on the back portion of an embryo. Um, we can see that here. This is what is called the neural plate. Um, this is what is going to eventually become um, the spinal cord and also um, eventually the brain as well. So the ectoderm is on the back portion of the embryo. It thickens to form this neural plate. Um, and then this again is eventually going to become the forebrain here at the top. Now, through development, the edges of this plate begin to curl, as we can kind of see happening here. Um, and if we turn this um, sideways, it would look more like this. It starts flat, and, and through development, and this is just happening on the course of days, these folds start to curl upwards. And by the 21st day of development, what is called this neural tube is formed here. So what was a flat plate, if in just the period of a couple of days has become a complete tube. This tube will become the spinal cord and the brain. This chamber will completely close on the 28th day and what we'll have at this stage are three interconnected chambers. So within the period of about 10 days, all of this is happening. These chambers will become the ventricles of the brain, the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. Now that we've kind of taken a quick look at how the neural tube forms, we'll take a look at what are called neural tubal defects. Now, as you can imagine, these type of defects 
in a developing fetus are happening very early. As we just looked at in the previous slide, these are things that are developing between the 18th and the 28th day of conception. So very, very early on. Now, any kind of neural tubal defect can be detected very early on through um, testing can be done um, in a variety of different ways. So basically, if you want genetic testing done, um, this genetic testing on um, your unborn child will pick up neural tubal defects. It's one of the main ones that they check for. Um, later on in development, these can also be seen on ultrasound as well. So um, neural tubal defects can be anything that affects the brain, spine, or spinal cord. As we saw, that neural plate becomes that neural tube, which eventually forms into being the spine in the brain. So any kind of neural tubal defect can affect um, the brain, spine, spinal cord, um, or any of these, depending upon what the defect is. So the first we'll take a look at is the spinal bifida. Um, um, with, uh, spinal bifida. So this um, basically what happens with spinal bifida is um, the bottom portion of the neural tube actually does not close. So um, here closely you can see um, this area here, this space does not close. So what happens here is you have a pocket of fluid essentially on the bottom portion of the spine. And this is one of the most common neural tubal defects. So with spinal bifida, again, the spinal column isn't closing completely during development. Um, also, a much more severe one is called anencephaly. With this one, the brain and the skull do not develop. So essentially, um, very little to no brain and skull matter develop. Anencephaly is fatal. Usually, the fetus will either um, be stillborn or die shortly after birth when this happens. So this can be very severe, again, where the brain and skull just don't develop at all, or they partially develop. Again, both spinal bifida and anencephaly are things that are going to be picked up when DNA testing or genetic testing are done, um, specifically genetic testing, um, if somebody were to choose to have that done. Also, these would be things that would be picked up later on in an ultrasound as well. There is also another one called the Chari malformation. Um, with this one, brain tissue doesn't stay contained within the skull, um, and it extends into the spinal canal. So um, kind of comes down to the, the upper portion of the spinal canal. Um, from what we know, we know that there is a greater risk of these type of defects if the mother is um, obese or has very poorly controlled diabetes, have been taking anti-seizure medications. Um, and, and again, these things are certainly not diagnostic. If, if a mother has uncontrolled or, or poorly controlled diabetes, it doesn't automatically mean that the fetus is going to have neural tubal defects. What these things are are correlations. Um, we see higher correlations in neural tubal defects and in mothers that have these certain risk factors. Um, the preventative measure is just to take folic acid. This helps quite a bit in um, prevention um, or just reducing the possibility of a fetus having neural tubal defects. So now let's take a look further at brain development after that neural tube has formed. Um, what we know most about is the cerebral cortex development. So this is a three millimeter thick um, section that surrounds the cerebral hemispheres. So here, as we're looking at this slice, um, this section of the brain, the cerebral um, cortex is the outer portion, the stark or outer portion here. This area is larger in human brains when compared to body size um, um, in relation to other species, particularly because our cerebral cortex is quite folded. And so there is more um, space essentially on our cerebral cortex. Now, neural circuits here play a large role in many things, including um, our perception of certain things in our environment, um, cognitive processes, and also movement control. 
Now let's take a closer look at how the cerebral cortex actually develops. Now, firstly, it develops from the inside outward. So here we're taking a look first on the far left at a very early slice of the cerebral cortex. Now, eventually it will become thicker and then finally in the late stages, much thicker. So again, this is going to be the cerebral cortex. Now it is forming from the inside out. So the innermost layer here closest to the innermost portion of the brain and it builds outward as it becomes thicker until eventually it gets to this stage here. Now this happens due to what we call progenitor cells or also stem cells. Um, they're, they are called um, either stem cells or progenitor cells. Um, so what basically happens is that you have progenitor cells and they divide and they, um, so one becomes two, two becomes four, so on and so forth. So they essentially copy themselves. And so one progenitor cell produces two progenitor cells. So more and more and more cells are being made and that thickens these layers, um, particularly the sum ventricular um, layer. Um, you can read about that in your text. Um, the sub ventricular layer becomes thicker and thicker because there's more and more of these cells. And at some point, the progenitor cells actually start to do what is called asymmetrical division. Now, in the early stages, what we see is again, just what we call symmetrical division, where one progenitor cell becomes two progenitor cells. Now, later on, we have asymmetrical division, where a progenitor cell becomes one progenitor cell and one brain cell. Now, again, this is all happening from the inside outward as these cells are dividing. So we start here and we get thicker and thicker and thicker building from this inside portion outward until we get to this stage here. Now these finer, the, the final outer layer here, what we get to here on the late stages, basically what has happened at this point is that now we have neurons, uh, brain cells, they migrate through five different neuron la layers here to get to this outside layer. So these later developing neurons are actually migrating all the way through these previous layers to get to this outermost layer here. Once this is complete, the progenitor cells that have been dividing all of this time receive a chemical signal that tells them to die. This is also called apoptosis. So at this point, the progenitor cells get a signal to die off and to stop dividing. Now the radial glia, which is this middle section here that we see, these eventually start to be transformed into astrocytes. If you remember from chapter two, astrocytes are part of the uh, glial cell family or the supporting cells for the central nervous system. These are our star cells. These are the supporting cells that perform all kinds of different supporting functions for neurons in our central nervous system. And after this happens, the neurons that are now here begin to connect with each other um, when they reach their final outward locations. So they start to actually connect up and these connections between neurons start to happen. Now, if we look closer at neuron connections, the ventricular zone, which I kind of mentioned earlier, has more neurons than what it needs. So if we take a look at here at birth, this is what this ventricular zone looks like versus at six years and then at 14 years. And you can notice way more dense here at six years than at 14 years. So why is that? Well, basically what is happening here through development is about 50% of the axons of the neurons here don't find a vacant cell to connect with or a vacant cell of the right type connect with. So eventually um, what happens is what is called synaptic pruning. So the cells that haven't found a postsynaptic cell to bind with start to die off. That's why you see the thinning out here from six years to 14 years. These cells or neurons that just haven't found um, a postsynaptic cell to meet up with, it's the right type, will be pruned out or cleaned out. Um, and how this happens more specifically is that they don't receive this chemical signal 
from a postsynaptic cell that tells them to survive. So when a neuron finds a vacant cell to connect with, it's the right type, once that connection is made, it receives a chemical signal from that postsynaptic cell that tells it to survive, stay alive. But the ones that don't match up with a postsynaptic cell don't receive that chemical signal, and then they die off. They become pruned. This is a very important process. Um, this is a form of kind of cleaning out of unneeded materials or unneeded neurons or cells. This is a very important thing that happens synaptic pruning. Now, again, we do think, though, that the reason why we have more neurons is um, been selected for evolutionarily. If you think about it, it's much more beneficial to have more neurons than you need than less neurons than you need. So it was probably adaptive for those individuals that had more neurons um, in that they were more likely to be able to make those connections. Their, their neurons were more likely to make those connections needed to um, produce uh, more cognitive behaviors and, and just be able to be more successful overall um, in building that more complex brain. These individuals that had more neurons were probably more likely to survive. They functioned better. They were more likely to produce offspring. So it's likely that we've evolved to have more neurons than what we need. And again, if you think about it just logically, it makes much more sense for us to have more than we need and then the extraneous ones to later on be pruned out through this process of synaptic pruning than to have fewer than what we really need. Now we've brushed on in the last slide complex brains, like our human brains. Um, let's focus more now on complex brains. So um, sometimes genes duplicate, right? Now when they duplicate, sometimes a mutation can happen. That mutation can be passed on. Now, this is likely what happened for more complex brains like ours. Um, a lot of times genetic mutations are bad, but occasionally they can actually be beneficial. And we, we brushed on this in our um, discussion in chapter one of how our brains likely evolved and how eventually we came to have more complex brains. Um, likely what may have happened um, if we're focusing on cell division, so if we think back to the progenitor cells that we were just talking about um, during symmetrical division when one progenitor cell is producing two progenitor cells. This type of symmetrical division lasts two whole days longer in humans than in chimpanzees, which are our closest genetic relatives. So we have two full days more of symmetrical division than chimpanzees do. What this means is that our cerebral cortex is going to become thicker. We're going to have more space um, in our cerebral cortex, meaning that we're going to have more cells and more opportunity for more neuron development and more neurons to connect. So um, this is time specifically for three more complete divisions. And you can imagine if one cell makes two, two makes four, if this is happening across your entire cerebral cortex for two full days and allows for three complete more divisions, this is creating a lot more cells. Asymmetrical division. So when symmetrical division stops, an asymmetrical division begins where again, a progenitor cell now produces another progenitor cell and um, a brain cell. This process also lasts longer in humans. which in the end result, again, gives us a larger cortex or a thicker cortex. Our cortex is about 15% thicker as a result of this. And again, it is highly likely that this just happened through some mutation that was selected for and passed on. Now, if we take an even closer look at our very complex brains, our large primate brains, we have what are called convoluted brains. Convoluted basically means that we have a lot of grooves and bulges along our cerebral cortex. If you think about the pictures that we've seen previously, the outermost layer of our brain, that darker portion that we were taking a look at earlier, is very grooved and bumped. There's a lot of bulges where the cortex curves in and out. And we think that this is really the way that 
our cerebral cortex allows us to have this much space for this many cells and, and also basically still containing our brain within our skull. And again, this gives us a much more uh, large space for cells or for neurons. Um, more neurons than our um, smoother brain folks. So our smoother brain um, rodents, for example. So here we're taking a look at a developing cortex of a mouse versus a developing cortex of a human. So here again, remember development is happening from the inside out. So we have the inside here and the outermost portion closer to the skull here. Now here is that VZ or ventricular zone and then subventricular zone here. Now what to notice is that, and again, what I want you to get here is just the gist. This section here for the mouse is much smaller than it is for us. We have thicker layers here because we have more cells dividing, more of these progenitor cells are dividing and becoming more progenitor cells and also brain cells. And more and more of these are traveling outwards. And this gives us more space, more cells, more chance for connections. But our brains still do have to fit inside our skulls. So we are going to have these grooves and bulges in our cerebral cortex. Um, but mice, for example, don't really have these same grooves and bulges. So we say that they have more smooth brains. Okay, now let's take a look at brain development after birth. So we know a lot of development happens during birth. We took a look at our neural um, plate that eventually becomes our brain and spinal cord. And we've kind of taken a look at how our um, cerebral cortex forms and how cells divide to make our cortex thicker. Um, but all of that is happening um, prenatal. What happens postnatal? We know brain development continues after birth, of course. Um, this happens over the course of a few decades for humans. At different regions of the cortex, which is the area of the brain, that outermost portion that we've been looking at thus far, what we do know is that different regions of the cortex seem to be active or seem to be correlated with specialized functions that our body performs. This does seem to be somewhat genetically programmed and neurons that are produced from progenitor cells um, will um, this is so interesting, will follow a specific glial fiber through those ventricular zones and subventricular zones to stay above a particular progenitor cell. So basically to stay connected to a particular progenitor cell. And we think this happens because um, they're going to produce um, a specialized function later on. Now, what we also know is that experience postnatal is also extremely critical. Um, for example, stereopsis, this is something in relation to your vision. Specifically, it allows you to see in depth or have some depth perception. This is something that happens as a function of experience in your environment. So if you don't experience certain things as a child developing, you may have issues with stereo vision, particularly um, the neural circuits that allow us to have this depth perception won't develop fully if the infant isn't viewing objects in a certain way and they're not viewing objects with both eyes during this critical period of development. Now, even if these eye movements can somehow be corrected surgically later in life, um, for example, if eye movements aren't happening the way that they should surgically, that can be fixed. But stereopsis, your brain's perception of depth, cannot be recovered if it is not developed during this critical period. Now, that is not to say that there can't be some rewiring that takes place. Some can. So, for example, after an amputation, so let's say um, an arm was partially amputated, for example. The part of the cerebral cortex that analyzed information received from that limb will start to analyze information from other adjacent regions. 
So basically what happens is that area of the cortex that processed information from that limb will start to process information from areas around that limb. So some rewiring can take place, particularly in the peripheral nervous system, um, if damage happens, for example. Now this brings us to something called neurogenesis. This is just the process by which new neurons are formed or made in the brain. Previously, we thought that this really didn't take place in the adult brain, but we now have evidence that some neuro neurogenesis does happen in a fully developed brain. That is, stem cells in your brain divide and form new neurons. Um, two areas in particular we see this in are the hippocampus and the olfactory bulb. And these are associated typically with training on new learning tasks. We see an increase in neurons in the hippocampus and um, incurrence of new um, smells or odors. Um, we, we have found increases in the survival rate of new neurons in the olfactory bulb. So what the point to take away from this is that new neurons can be produced in the adult brain. But this does tend to be limited to a, a certain few areas within the brain. Something else to note is that this neuron production doesn't seem to be correlated to any kind of repair of brain damage related to stroke or head injury. So even though new neurons can be produced, we don't have evidence that this neuron production can help repair any damage incurred in these ways. Now let's take a look at how your brain develops from that neural tube we've kind of been looking at throughout this lecture. So here we have our neural tube, which is that um, plate that we've been looking at here. So here is the front end and the hind end. This is going to, this portion of the neural tube is going to become your brain. So the frontmost portion is going to become your forebrain and the backmost portion or the caudal direction for the tail end is going to become your hindbrain. And of course, the midsection is going to become your midbrain. But first, let's take a look at the forebrain, so that frontmost portion or toward the rostral part of the brain. First, we'll take a look at what is called the telencephalon. That is the forwardmost portion. And then right behind it, you have the diencephalon here. So this particular area contains most of the cerebral hemispheres that are going to be covered by your cerebral cortex. This also is going to contain the limbic system and the basal ganglia. Now, again, um, the portion of that is also going to become the cerebral cortex. This is also um, referred to as outer bark. Again, we looked at this earlier in lecture, but if we take a look, the cerebral cortex is this uh, darker portion that we see here. So kind of the outlined area here, the darker portion surrounding the lighter portion of the brain. Um, again, this is greatly convoluted in humans. Basically, it's grooved and bumpy, and you can see that on the outer surface. And again, we think that's because we have an increased time of cell division, and so the cortex becomes more grooved in order to allow for more neurons to be present. So just an increase in space. Um, the sulci are the small grooves that we see. Um, here's an example of one here. You can see a singular one here, sulcus, right here. And the larger, deeper grooves are called fissures. And we can see one of those here. So the deeper grooves are fissures. The more shallow ones, like this one and this one, are called um, sulci. And finally, gyri or gyri are the bulges between. Um, the sulci or the fissures. So the bulging areas that kind of go back out between the indention areas of the sulci and the fissures are called um, gyri or gyri. So what's interesting is that about two thirds of the cortex is actually hidden in the grooves. So the majority of your cerebral cortex, you can't readily see if you're just looking at the brain from the outside because it's actually um, indented in into the grooves. Now let's look more into the cerebral cortex and the different sections of it. So first we can take a look at the frontal portion or the frontal lobe. 
This is everything in front of what we call the central sulcus. So we can see the central sulcus here. And here, this whole front portion here is the frontal lobe. And what, the view that we're looking at here is a profile view. Someone would be facing this direction here, so their nose would be out here. They would be facing to the right. So all of this front section here, this frontal lobe, um, is going to be everything in front of the central sulcus. Now, just behind the central sulcus is the parietal lobe. The temporal lobe is more forward toward the base of the brain here. This is around your ear region. And then finally, in the very back portion of the brain is the occipital lobe. Now, if we take a look more in the back portion of the brain, we are going to look at the primary visual cortex. Now, again, this is in the back portion of the brain. So here we're taking a look at the opposite profile view. So this would be if someone was facing to the left. So their nose would be here. They're looking in this left direction. So this right here would be the back portion of the brain. And back here is the occipital lobe. And on the outside here the, uh, of the cerebral, the cerebral cortex surrounding this area here, this is where the primary visual cortex is. This is going to be the receiving area. So the area that receives visual information from the environment. So this is going to be the area that's receiving input from your eyes. Then we have the primary auditory cortex, which is going to be in the temporal lobe around your ear area, kind of right above your ear area here. And as you might imagine, this area is going to receive auditory information from your ears. And next we have what is called the primary somatosensory cortex. This is in the parietal lobe. So this is in the top portion of your, your brain here. This is right behind that central sulcus. So this top portion here of your cortex. Um, this is going to receive body senses. So um, things from touch, for example, from your hands, from your feet, anything from your skin. This is going to be the receiving area for that information. Now, in addition to primary receiving areas, the ones that we just want to look at, we also have what are called association cortexes for each primary receiving area. So these are areas that take information from the primary receiving areas and do something with it. So these areas are really, we think, more responsible for the actual perception of what the information is, whatever stimulus it is, and also um, planning, if you want to think about it as, as planning, uh, basically kind of how to respond to the stimulus that's being received. Um, these occupy a larger area than the primary receiving areas. So this is kind of what happens in the sensation of the stimulus, whether it is a touch that you are perceiving in the primary somatosensory cortex, or if it is something that is visual that you are receiving in your primary visual cortex, um, once that is received by the primary area, the association cortex then becomes activated, and then that portion of, of the chain of events between the sensing of the stimulus in the primary areas and the actual action that the body makes in response to that, that is what is kind of happening in the association cortex. So kind of what to do with the stimulus, how to react. We also think that these association cortexes can help integrate information from multiple sensory areas. So for example, if you have um, stimuli that is both um, visual and somatosensory, these association areas we think can help to kind of bring these sensations together or to integrate them. Now we take a look at the motor cortex. So this is located in the front of the somatosensory cortex that we were taking a look at on the last slide. This is um, around your parietal lobe area. This is going to, it's right here on the top of your, top of your brain right here. Right there. So this is going to contain neurons that are connected to muscles in your body. Now what we think is this frontal association area 
um, more here is going to be involved in the planning and execution of the movements that you make in response to um, stimuli in your environment. So we have um, sections of this part of the motor cortex. Um, the first would be the premotor area, which is located here in front of the primary motor cortex. We think that this area is more active um, when planning and strategizing is happening. Whereas in the motor association cortex, we think that this is actually going to be what is kind of controlling the behavior or response we make um, to any kind of um, somatosensory um, information that we're receiving. So the thing to take away from this is that you have a primary receiving area, you have an association area, and you have a premotor area. All of these different areas are active depending upon what portion of the task is at hand. If you are receiving somatosensory information, if you are having to process that information, if you are having to um, figure out what to do in response to that stimulation, and then actually having to execute that movement or that behavior um, in response to that stimulus, that will dictate which area is particularly active and some neurons firing in that area. Um, that will dictate which areas tend to be more active in that given moment. Now we move ahead to the limbic system. This, in, um, this, uh, this system involves um, some of the older areas of the brain, the hippocampus and the amygdala, the fornix, and also the mammillary bodies. So we see these here more toward the base of the skull here. And again, this is more toward the older areas of the brain. And what I mean by that, again, like I've mentioned in previous lectures, these were the areas of the brain that evolutionarily were developed first, which makes sense because these particular areas are more active or more responsible for more basic processes. Um, for example, in the mammillary bodies, we think that the development of these coincides with emotional responses and in feelings, particularly the amygdala. Most researchers will look into um, neuroscience research really heavily correlates the amygdala um, a, as a um, primary area of the brain that tends to be very active um, during um, emotional activities, emotional responses that we make. Um, the amygdala is highly associated to emotions and feelings. And the hippocampus is particularly active um, when we are engaged in a new um, task. So if we're learning a new um, behavior or if we are having to um, perform some kind of a memory task, we see a lot of activation in the hippocampus. Now we'll take a look at the basal ganglia and the diencephalon. So these are, um, these, the basal ganglia contains multiple structures. I have them listed here. You have the caudate nucleus, uh, the putamen or the putamen, uh, the globus pallidus. Um, and also um, these are located under the lateral ventricles. So those ventricles, those main two ventricles that we took a look at very early on in lecture, the ones that go outside, so laterally, um, we can see them highlighted uh, here, right here. There's one and there's the other. So lateral out to the sides. Right underneath those is where we'll see the basal ganglia. We think that these, uh, that this area is very active when um, you are performing movements. And we think that this area is really kind of um, highly correlated with the control of movements. We see damage to this area in Parkinson's patients. So for example, neurons in this particular area are um, basically the neurons that are going to send information to the different areas of the basal ganglia, particularly the caudate nucleus and the putamen or the putamen. We think that these neurons are highly affected in Parkinson's patients. And that is why we see um, tremors and things like that in Parkinson's patients. They have difficulty making smooth, controlled movements. A lot of times they have um, what looks again like a tremor or shakiness. And we think that that is because the neurons in this area of the brain are um, damaged or have degraded. Now we can take a look at the diencephalon. So this surrounds the third ventricle. So that is that ventricle that is below 
the lateral ventricles. So you have the lateral ventricles going to either side laterally and then connected to it. You can't really see it because the basal ganglia is kind of in the way, but it's connected right below there. Um, that's the third ventricle. Diencephalon surrounds the third ventricle. Within this area, we have the thalamus. This receives most input from the cerebral cortex. We also have the hypothalamus, which controls the autonomic nervous system and the endocrine system. We're going to talk about the autonomic nervous system here toward the end of this lecture. Um, but these are, again, very important systems within our brain. These are going to be, uh, the endocrine system, for example, is going to regulate um, hormone production and things like that. This also is heavily related to, and I'm sure you guys have heard of fight or flight, but these are, again, basic um, responses that we make to stimuli, so fight, flight, feed, mate. These are survival mechanisms. The hypothalamus seems to be quite active during these times of fight, flight, feed, and mate. Also contained here are the pituitary glands. These are particularly active during adolescent development, um, but again, um, very old structure, basic structures that are um, imperative to our growth and development as human beings. So all of the areas of the brain that we've been focused on over the past handful of slides have been what comprises the forebrain. So here we're again taking a look at the neural tube. All of those areas are in the forebrain. Now we're moving on to the midbrain or the mesencephalon. So this area surrounds the cerebral aqueduct. And remember, um, this is the area that helps flow of the cerebral spinal fluid. Um, within this area, we have what's called the rectum. This is the um, dorsal portion or the back portion. If you think back um, to early in this lecture when we were talking about anatomical directions, dorsal is back portion. So the back portion of the midbrain would be the pectin. So if we look in here in the midbrain, which is right here in this area, the back portion here, this little yellow area, is the rectum. We think here we have principal structures, um, um, two. Um, one is the superior, one is the inferior colliculi. Um, the superior one is part of our visual system, whereas the inferior one is part of our auditory system. So we have two main structures in this area. One plays more of a role in the visual system. One plays more of a role in our auditory system. Now, underneath the pectum or the dorsal portion of the midbrain, um, this would be more the ventral portion of the midbrain. So the front part of the midbrain, we can see that here, front portion, this red area. That is the tegmentum. And it's right under that tectum area. This includes um, the rostral end of what we call the reticular formation. This area of the brain receives sensory information and also plays a very large role in sleep, muscle tone, arousal, movement, and vital reflexes. So this is a very active and very important portion of your brain. We also have in the midbrain what is called gray matter or periaqueductal gray matter. It is a very tiny section of the midbrain. You can see it's here, this tiny little dot right here. This is right above the very bottom portion of your brain or your brainstem. Um, this is mostly cell bodies of neurons that surround the cerebral aqueduct. The neural circuits here control the sequence of movements and what we call species typical behaviors. So we have as a species behaviors more typical or uh, more associated with us as a species. Um, this happens in every species, species typical behaviors, species typical movements. We think our area um, is basically what is controlling the sequence of those movements. Um, what we also know is that the uh, administration of morphine decreases pain sensitivity by stimulating receptors in this particular area of the brain or stimulating the receptors neurons in the gray matter of the brain. Now, even deeper, we have what is called the red nucleus. Um, that is located right here. And again, we're looking at a cross-section of the brain, obviously, here. 
um, axons from neurons here make up a fiber system that brings in motor information from your cerebral cortex and your cerebellum all the way into your spinal cord. So this particular area is very important for motor information and bringing in of motor information to your spinal cord. We also have another area right below that called the substantia nigra or black substance. You can see here, even in this cross section of the brain, it's a bit of a darker section here, right there, right below the red nucleus. This area is very important. Same neurons to have um, axons that project into the basal ganglia. This particular area, when um, we see generation of neurons here, we think that this is really the root cause of Parkinson's. So Parkinson's disease, um, again, is one of uh, diseases that leads to a lot of issues with movement, muscle tremors, uncontrollable shaking. Um, we think that neurons generate in the substantia nigra um, and project into the basal ganglia when they degenerate. And this is um, really what we see in Parkinson's patients. Now we have the last portion of that neural tube. So we have been looking at just now areas in the midbrain. Earlier we took a look at pieces in the forebrain. Now we're still in that neural tube and we're looking at the endmost portion here or the caudal um, end or, or the tail end. We're going to be looking at the hindbrain. Now the hindbrain is what surrounds the fourth ventricle or that last ventricle. Um, this is also called the metencephalon. Um, within this area we have the cerebellum. It is kind of this round structure here, right at the base of your skull. Um, this seems to be associated with the integration of sensory information. It also seems to play a role in the smoothness of motion or helping our movements be quite smooth. Damage to this particular area can affect multiple things. It can affect how you stand, how you walk, and also if it, if it plays a role in the smoothness of motion, it makes sense that if you have damage to this particular area, you may have issue with coordinating movements as well. So for example, multi-step movements like, um, for example, the throwing of a baseball. There's multiple steps involved in throwing a baseball, yet we do that in one smooth fluid motion. But someone with damage to this area may not be able to perform an action like that smoothly. It may be hurt, it may be shaky, um, that's just one example I can think of right off the top of my head. Um, now we look at the pons, and that is going to be at the top of the brainstem here, right here, this area. This contains part of that reticular formation we mentioned earlier. This particular area is important for sleep and arousal. Remember, I've mentioned multiple times that the very bottom portion part of the brain is really what's playing a role in these most basic functions like sleep, arousal, eating, walking, things like that. So it makes sense that these particular areas are very active when we are engaged in these processes. So the pawns seem to be quite active or tend to be quite important for both sleep and arousal. Um, then we have the myencephalon, which um, contains the medulla, which is right below the pawn. So the medulla oblongata right here. Um, this also contains the other portion of the reticular formation. This seems to regulate respiration or your breathing, also your cardiovascular system, and the control of skeletal muscle. Very, very important functions.
So here we take a look at the spinal cord itself. So we've taken the vertebral column off. Now we're looking at the actual cord. And what the spinal cord is going to do for us is distribute motor fibers to both glands and muscles. This is going to allow collection of somatosensory information. So sensation from outside of your body. So for example, touch on the skin, things like that. Um, this particular area is going to allow that information to come in and be sent to the brain. Um, and again, this is going to be protected through that vertebral column that passes directly through. Now, early on in development, the actual spinal cord itself and the vertebral column are the same length. Now, throughout development, the column will grow faster. Remember on the last slide, I said that the column is longer than the spinal cord. So throughout development, the column will actually grow faster and the spinal roots will be pushed downward to fill out the um, additional space um, that the cord doesn't fill out. This is also called the horse's tail, the, the spinal roots. Um, the ones that are most caudal or most tail end, um, again, are called the cauda equina or horsed tail. Um, now we take a look at L2 through L5 right here. This is the bottom portion of the lumbar here. This particular space is very important, L2 to L5. In this particular area is where they actually inject an epidural for childbirth. So they do an injection in this space here, and the injection um, is into the cerebral spinal fluid um, in a sac of the dura mater or the dura mater. If you remember very early on in this lecture, we talked about the protective layers surrounding the spinal cord and the brain, layers of the meninges. The dura mater is the outermost layer of that protective um, layer. So the injection goes all the way through into a sac within the dura mater or dura mater and injects an anesthetic into the cerebral spinal fluid there. Thus far, we've went through brain structures and also the spinal cord. So we have discussed the central nervous system thus far. But now is a good time to start talking about the PNS or the peripheral nervous system. This is what is going to allow the sending of sensory information into the central nervous system or to bring in information to the spinal cord and then to the brain. Um, this particular system sends messages um, from the CNS to the muscles and the glands as well. So this system brings in information to the brain and spinal cord, and then it also brings out information from the brain and spinal cord back to your muscles and everything. So you can actually make um, movements or behaviors um, in reaction to the stimuli that you are encountering in your environment. So this allows information to come in. The system also allows information to go back out from the central nervous system. Oh, it is broken up into parts. First is the somatic nervous system. This is the system that is active when we have voluntary control of body movements through skeletal, skeletal muscles. So for example, leg movements, and arm movements, again, voluntary control. We also have the autonomic nervous system. This is the regulation of what we call smooth muscle um, or basically your organs. So this is involuntary bodily movements. So um, movements of your heart, for example, or glands within your body, things that you don't have voluntary control over. Now we look at part of the peripheral nervous system called the somatic system. This encompasses what are called cranial nerves. These are nerves that are attached to the ventral portion of your brain or the ventral surface of your brain, which is that front portion right here. So the front portion of your brain. You have 12 pairs of cranial nerves. Each pair is allocated to a certain sense. So for example, you have an olfactory cranial nerve, an optic cranial nerve, um, olfactory for smell, optic for vision, so on and so forth. 
the role of these nerves is to receive somatosensory information. So sensory information from the outside environment, these nerves are to bring that information into the brain. Um, for example, um, these are numbered, by the way, pairs 1 through 12, um, and pair 10 is called the vagus pair or the vagus nerve. This regulates your organs in your thoracic and abdominal cavities. And here you see a full listing of all 12 pairs. And here, uh, more specifically, you can actually see which pairs are connected where. So now moving on past cranial nerves, we look at spinal nerves. So here again, we are still in the somatic system. This is in your spinal cord. So these are spinal nerves that are bringing in sensory information into your spinal cord. Now, cells within the, what is called the dorsal root, we can see that here, are projecting into the spinal column and spinal cord here. So sensory information is coming in and projecting into the dorsal portion or the back portion of your spinal cord. And they leave and travel back out through cells that project out through the ventral root or the front portion of the spinal cord. So information in through the dorsal root, information out through the ventral root. And as it comes out, these cells again are projecting their axons out, outward through the ventral root, all the way through to the muscles here. And they will project back into the peripheral system, and this will allow your body to make any kind of response necessary to stimuli in the environment. Now let's follow the full sequence of events. So all axons that bring sensory stimuli into uh, the spinal cord are um, projecting in through that dorsal root. These axons are bringing information in from the peripheral nervous system into the central nervous system. Um, these incoming axons or that dorsal root are called afferent because they are bringing information in to the CNS. The ones that are projecting outward and bringing information back outward from the spinal cord to the peripheral system, back to the muscles and such. These are called efferent, with an E, efferent. So bringing information out, away from the central nervous system, back toward the peripheral nervous system. Okay, so what we were just looking at was the somatic nervous system. So that involves voluntary movements. So for example, movements of limbs, arms and legs, hands, um, things that you are aware of um, or voluntary movements. Now we're going to look at the portion of the peripheral nervous system that is involuntary. This is the autonomic nervous system. This involves smooth muscle found in organs um, and also your skin. Um, your skin actually is also an organ. It's the largest organ that you have. Um, so this involves your skin, also your blood vessels, um, even um, the pupil and lens of your eye, the walls of your gut, your gallbladder, your urinary bladder, all of these things that you don't have voluntary control over. The autonomic nervous system it is what um, makes these um, different sections of your body smooth muscle react in the way that they do in response to environmental stimuli. Uh, within the autonomic nervous system we have two branches. The first of which is called the sympathetic system. This is the system that becomes active during um, times of high stress or times of, of flight or fight responses. When this system is activated you have an expenditure of energy from the energy reserve that you have in your body. So this is during a period of excitation. During this time, you will have an increase in blood flow, um, an increased amount of awareness. You may have heightened respiration, dry mouth, things like this. Now, after this time elapses and it is time to calm back down and come back down to resting, that is when the parasympathetic 
system kicks in. So this is the system that brings you back down to rest and restores your body energy supply. So it brings you back down to rest after the activation of the sympathetic system has happened. So for example, if you have to give a talk in class and you don't like to speak in public, you may have this anxious or a nervous response. You may have that um, increased respiration, increased heart rate. You may have dry mouth. This is that sympathetic system kicking in. But after you give your talk and it's over, your body comes back down to rest. That is the parasympathetic system kicking in to decrease respiration, lower your heart rate, um, begin a salivation process again to re-wet your mouth. Um, so sympathetic is more of that energetic excitation response. Parasympathetic is more of the calming, resting response. So here in this last slide of the lecture, we can take a look at the two branches of the autonomic nervous system, parasympathetic on the left, sympathetic on the right. Now you'll notice that the uh, sympathetic uh, nerves on the right say fight or flight. Now again, this is going to be the type of excitatory reactions that your body would have um, versus the left-hand side, which is more of the rest and digest, the calming response to the stimulation of the sympathetic system. So this is where you're going to, again, have the slowing of the heart rate. Um, you're going to have um, your stomach activity become um, essentially active again. So um, digestion of food and things like this will begin to happen again when this system is, is, um, is turned on. Um, so just know one is more of an excitatory response sympathetic system. One is more of that calming, bringing back down to rest system, which is the parasympathetic nerves or the parasympathetic system. So as always, make sure to go through this chapter quite carefully. I certainly don't expect that you're going to know every term that you see in this chapter. It is very dense. I am very well aware of that. I'm just hoping that after this lecture and after reviewing the chapter that you have an idea of what the different branches um, of the peripheral system look like. So um, in terms of the somatic system versus what we just took a look at here, the autonomic system, and also some idea of how our brains develop through that neural tube that we looked at earlier in lecture. Um, just, just some basic concepts. So I hope you'll have a great day and I will be back with you soon. Bye-bye.